And there we go. Hello, lovely Dr. Juliet Balfour. Here you are again from Somerset Live. And we are talking tonight about menopause, HRT, and safe dosing, really, the recommended levels, why we have them, um, and what you could do if you are concerned about about those. So I guess that really sets it off, doesn't it, in a way? Um, why do we have recommended doses? So they're the doses that the studies have been on and the research has been on. So they're doses that the, the manufacturers put in their licenses and that we are, that's in our guidelines to, to, to give to our patients. So there's a range of doses. If we're talking about estrogen, you know, we, as you know, we like to give estrogen through the skin as a first line thing because it has no um, increased risk of of thrombosis so with all the different uh transdermal estrogen products there are maximum standard recommended doses and yes so so i think we've got a chart haven't we to show people <laughs> please bear with me while i attempt to do this i'm going to share the screen and we're going to look at the women's health concerns fact sheet and there it is can you see that Everybody, yes, it's come up. So hopefully everyone can see it. So just to say, Women's Health Concern, this is the patient arm of the British Menopause Society, and it's packed full of really brilliant uh, evidence-based uh, information on lots of women's health issues, but there's a, particularly a lot of stuff about uh, menopause. So for any patients who are worried about anything, it's a really good uh, resource to go to first, and they have lots and lots of patient information leaflets. And you can find this one. Um, it's, uh, it, it says, it's, it's entitled HRT, types, doses, and regimens, I think, something like that. And this is page three of the uh, year we go. Yay, types, doses, and regimens. There you go. I've still got a memory. Um, so this is this is really quite useful. And, and it's really useful for doctors as well, particularly when we've had all these dreaded shortages. So if someone's on something, it's not available, you can look and see what the equivalent dose is. So this is very useful. But, and it does actually say at the bottom of this, everybody's different in how they absorb things, how much they need, um, how much they need over time. It depends also what their own ovaries are doing. So this is a really good guide, but some people might find they need a much higher dose than others. So, it, you know, it's, it's not set in stone. Um, but so if we talk about with that, with that chart, it, it, the easiest thing to talk about is the, the patch because that's the most straightforward. So um, the maximum recommended licensed dose of an estradiol patch is 100 micrograms and then if you're not if you're on something different you can have a look at the chart and see what the equivalent is that you're on and and it divides it into ultra low low medium and high but it's it's not high as in too high it's the the, the highest recommended dose okie dokie now so basically what we're talking then is really around about, I think it's normally four pumps so sort of maximum um, three Lenzetto sprays um, as you said around about a 100 milligram patch. Um, can't remember how many is that. Three to four is it? Two, no, two to three Sandrina gel sachets of the one milligram. Two to three, one. yeah, three milligrams. Yeah, yeah. Although, yes, there's a bit of variation depending on who you talk to. But yes, that basically that's it. But with Lenzetto, interestingly, it we, we this isn't as strong as we thought it was. So this is the spray which some people really like. But we think probably three sprays of Lenzetto is roughly equivalent to a 50 microgram patch. Um, and if you go higher on the Zetto, actually, it's not a linear increase. So um, you, if you go if you go to six sprays of Lenzetto, it's not necessarily the same as a hundred microgram patch. It might be more, it might be less. So that's an interesting one. But if people do well on between one to three sprays of Lenzetto, it's a, it's a really good option. Yeah. Now we seem to be finding ourselves in a situation now where there are quite a number of people who are using more than the recommended doses. Um, and a general perception that, you know, when you said before, we're all individual and there's a variation. How many people, do we know really how many people would actually, in a general population, need more and what, who would they be? So in my experience, and I've given an awful lot of HRT to people, I very rarely need to go up higher than those doses. So what the sort of standard um, guidelines really are is I think if, you, if someone really liked a method and they got up, they went gradually up and they still had symptoms. So they got up to, for instance, their 100 microgram patch. If they still had lots of symptoms, we'd start to think, OK, well, maybe they're one of these people that doesn't absorb this particular method really well. Um, and then we'd think about, OK, well, let's try something else. So if try a different brand of patch or try a gel or try the spray. Uh, we sometimes do levels, estradiol levels, just to see 
whether they're getting a reasonable amount of estrogen into their blood through whichever method. But we don't tend to do the estradiol levels until they're on the maximum dose. Um, and then we see, and sometimes they're fine, sometimes they're very low. We think, okay, well, maybe they're not absorbing it. But with a slight word of caution, uh, which is, uh, we mainly go on symptoms because we don't quite know how reliable the estradiol blood testing is. It's quite reliable if you're on a patch, if you get your estradiol checked on, on day two of a patch, because because the patches produce such lovely steady levels of estradiol. But if you think about the gels, you put the gel on in the morning and you have a sort of peak after a few hours, four hours maybe, and then the levels sort of go down a bit. And the spray, you probably get a peak a bit earlier. So, oh, oh. <laughs> hello dog. Um, you, 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 you can't have a conversation without the dog, I'm afraid. Absolutely, no problem. Um, but so, so basically with, with, with the patch and with the gel and the spray, kind of depends when you take take the blood test and we've got no particular specific guidelines on that uh, and sometimes you know we just don't know how reliable that blood test is but on a patch it, it's quite reliable but we wouldn't and the other thing is to think well if someone's on a maximum dose and if they're if, if they're absorbing it they've got good levels in their blood we have another think gosh what else is going on in their life so is, is there another cause for a particular symptoms that, that's persisting or is do they need to look a bit more at this, the stress levels how much sleep they're getting what they're eating what how they're exercising so um if you get to the top of the level it's not working we have to think laterally about what it might be occasionally i think much younger just, women just before, need we, before we get let me take you back. So, if because there's a lot of you, know, a lot of people, if we're not absorbing that, are there other alternatives then, like, you know, trying before we get to thinking of other reasons, trying a different type of HRT, trying the gel instead of the patch, or, yeah. you know, making sure you're not putting the putting tight fitting clothing on straight after you've put it on, um, making sure that your skin is clean and you haven't put your moisturizer on right before it or right or, or straight afterwards, you haven't gone for a swim, you haven't done sweaty exercise. <laughs> The, these sorts of are they sorts of things that people should sort of take into account as well but you know trying yeah. different types i guess uh, like. absolutely so yes the, those are the classic errors you know because it really really important that the particular the gels and the patch you put on clean skin if you've got a layer of moisturizer or sun cream or something on there um again we, we it's, it's important not to have a shower or wash the area for at least an hour after you put gel on so you're absolutely right so it yes it's a good idea to go back to basics just double check they're using it right they're using it right um right amount that for changing their patch at the right time you know because sometimes you find all people say oh i forgot to change my patch and i have my blood level and it was low of course it would be because it you know that the, the level has gone down so you're absolutely right back to basics first just check they're doing it right slowly go up to the highest level then either if it's if think about it, not we don't always do the blood tests but either blood if, if they say oh but i love the patch i really want to stay on this patch Yes. OK, let's just see. Are you absorbing it? Um, and then if not, yeah, you change to a different method. So some some people find they absorb one brand of patch better than another. And with the patches, it's always, always worth saying, well, do they do they stay on? Because if they're very crinkly or they fall off every time they get sweaty or, or have a shower, then you're really not going to be getting good absorption there. And And some women get sort of irritation where the patch goes. Um, it gets quite red and sore. And I see some women who are so they just they stoically carry on and you see them they've got red patches all over their thighs mm -hmm. or whatever and you know if, if you're getting if, if the patch is irritating you you're probably you may not be absorbing it properly um and you need to try one, one with a different glue and we find some people react to one particular glue from one patch but perhaps you're fine with another patch um or you change to a gel or a spray um and sometimes uh people change we give people oral estrogen so um Estrogen tablets are still an option. If someone is young and low risk for thrombosis, um, or just be once a, you know, just a tablet, a combined tablet they can take once a day, forget about it. That's absolutely fine if it's their choice if they want that. Um, and sometimes people absorb estrogen from a, a tablet better. Sometimes they absorb it worse because it's got to go through the through the through the system. So think about finding the right HRT. It, it's it's so individual. Everybody's different, and there's often a lot of tinkering around until you get the right right preparation for the right person and then you've got you've got what's happening with someone's ovaries so a younger person then might be having still some ovarian activity and a much older person might not be having any and that you have to take that into account with symptoms but also when you're doing the blood test because occasionally we see a really high estradiol level and it might be that that person's just had a surge their ovaries have suddenly decided to kick in and produce a bit of estrogen so you've got your estrogen hrt plus a bit of estrogen from your ovaries and woo you get a really high level 
Yeah. The, you mentioned individuals there. Now, this seems to be, there seems to be a couple of things that have, have come over the last few years that people have a belief now that there are no risks associated with HRT in particular and that if, as an individual, they may well require much more than before. And you outlined a couple of, of, of you know, that you said that was relatively rare, but are there people, let's, let us take, take a case study for a moment. Let me pretend that I'm Jenny, I'm 32, I have just gone through POI, premature ovarian insufficiency, um, and am now on HRT. Am I likely to be the kind of person who would need more because I'm younger and have gone through that? Or had I gone through surgical menopause, would I need more than, you know, more than somebody of my own age? Very possibly, yeah. It poss not, not definitely, but possibly. Um, and so somebody who's had their, their ovaries out, you'd really think about adding in testosterone as well later on if they needed it, um, because we lose half our testosterone if we have our ovaries out. Um, so yes, it's often the younger people, as, as you say, who might need slightly higher doses. Um, the problem with, with the higher doses, we don't know the, the safety profile because the studies haven't been done. So we have if someone is going higher than the, the guidelines, firstly, they do need to be told that we haven't got the studies. You know, we think you need it, but we haven't got the full safety profile. So what we call informed consent is really important. And then the other thing to think about if someone is going higher is protecting the, their endometrium, the, the lining of their womb. So um, if they've still got a uterus, as most people know, um, the, the, it's the estrogen to help with all the symptoms and the long-term health benefits. But if you just give estrogen, the lining of the womb will, will, will thicken. Um, so you need progestogen or progesterone to thin that, keep that lining thin. And if you don't have enough progesterone, progestogen, um, you can, the, the lining get thick and can then develop into something called hyperplasia and abnormal cells and actually cancer of the lining of the womb. And unfortunately, because we're all getting bigger, um, there's lots of risk factors for cancer of the lining of the womb. One is not taking enough progesterone. Another one is the fact that having a high BMI. Um, and so the, the instance of cancer of the womb, endometrial carcinoma is going up at the moment a lot. So it, it's something we all need to be aware of. Now, there was an interesting comment that I saw made the other day, actually, with somebody saying, well, you know, an endometrial cancer, sort of treating it in the same same way as, as any other particular cancer. It's sort of like, oh, how can we know that, that, you know, they're ever caused by HRT because cancers take so long to develop? Is that the case with an endometrial cancer? So, so HRT doesn't cause endometrial cancer unless you're having unopposed estrogen or, or the wrong doses. Um, as there's lots of different risk factors for getting it. So, so, so being overweight and um, having polycystic ovary syndrome or not having kids um, and also having type, type 2 diabetes, all sorts of risk factors. Um, and in fact, the, the, if you have the right amount of um, estrogen and progesterone. Yes, so I phrased the question very badly. Let me rephrase it. It's more to the point of if I had not had the protective um, progesterone on that endometrium, how quickly could that become cancerous if I were unlucky enough to be developing one? Oh, right. Over uh, six months, a year, two years. Uh, it, it depends. Um, but but yes, well, it's it, not necessarily one of these slow growing ones like a breast no, cancer. No, it's, it's breast not no, it can be slow growing, but but not, not necessarily. And oh, sorry, <laughs> I just fell over. <laughs> we actually know that once people are on the continuous combined HRT, which is estrogen all the time and progesterone all the time, that you have a much, you have a lower risk of endometrial cancer than somebody who's not on HRT at all. So HRT is that can be protective. Um, uh, of individual cancer as long as you're on, on, on the right dose of, of progesterone or I say progesterone or progestogen so so we've got the synthetic progestogens and then you've got progesterone which is eutrogestan which we're often talking about which is the body identical micronized progesterone that we often use nowadays. And that I guess is the next important question so let's say somebody has been prescribed two patches and a, and a pump of gel or something along those lines. How do we know how much of a progesterone or a progestin to give them to protect the endometrium? What do we know about that? Because it's uncharted territory, really, isn't it? Yeah, so we don't know. So so we, we tend to say we double double the progestin if they're on continuous combined, um, and we increase it a bit if they're on, on the sequential. Um, but again, we don't know with, are there any risks of doubling the eutrogestan? We, we, we like eutrogestan because it's got a really good safety 
profile, it doesn't increase the risk of blood clots and it doesn't increase the risk of breast cancer for at least the first five years. Um, so we really like it from that point of view. But unfortunately, it's not brilliant at keeping the line of the wounds in. And so, in fact, there's lots of discussion at the moment in the British Medical Society at what dose of estrogen to up the uterogestan. Um, and in some cases, we're actually thinking of upping it at 100 microgram patch or even less if someone's got lots of risk factors for endometrial cancer. There's no guidelines on that at the moment. Um, and hopefully we will get some at some point. And there's no guidelines because there's no research. So because we just don't know. So everybody's, you know, as usual, we're treating people as an individual. So if I saw somebody who needed a 100 microgram patch, who was very overweight and had lots of risk factors for endometrial cancer, I might now actually double her uterogestan at that dose. Um, but anyone going above that dose, we would we would we would we would increase the dose of uterogestan. We don't keep on in, increasing it. Um, but as I say, I think most menopause specialists find they don't need to go much higher than those standard doses. With, you know, as, if, as long as you find something that that suits the patient. Um, and we also, if, if people are getting abnormal bleeding, if they're if they're on standard doses, but in fact they keep on getting unscheduled bleeding, we often now double the uterogestan for those patients as well. Um, and when you say double, is normally you would take it one every night continuously or two for 14 days. So does that mean you take two every night um, for 14, for, for every night or four for, for, for 12 days? How would that work? Yeah, so I think, um, yes, yeah, so all you can do is with, we've, we've got 100 uh, milligram capsules. So absolutely for continuous, instead of one every night, two every night. Um, some people for the, the, the sequential, which is uh, normally, as you say, two 100s for two weeks out of every four weeks. Some of us will just up it by one. So you have 300, three for two weeks out of four weeks. Some people will double it. Um, but we know some people don't get on very well with you to just Dan. Um, so um, uh, so I, I would probably go up by one unless it, unless it was a very high risk patient. I would probably go up to 300 for two weeks out of, out of every, every four And weeks. if they're finding that they, they're not getting on with it, um, does it matter? You know, could they talk to their GP about using it vaginally? Is that going to make any difference to, to improving their mood or other symptoms that they get from it if they're not taking it well? Absolutely, certainly. So, so some people love Utrogestan, it makes them feel calm and sleepy and relaxed. Um, and other people hate it and it makes them feel moody and, and grumpy and, and low. And so we always suggest people try it orally first because that's the way it's licensed. But it is acceptable um, practice by lots of medical specialists. Say so if, you, if you really can't tolerate it uh, orally, fine, you, you can use it vaginally. Um, you wouldn't get any calming and sleeping effect, but also hopefully you wouldn't get any, any mood changing effect. But this is a really important thing to say that um, sometimes on social media, women are talking about um, that if you have your uterogestan vaginally, you can reduce the dose. And that is not that's not considered safe by the British Menopause Society or any other national menopause societies. So some women, when they use their we suggest you can use the same capsule as you use orally. Just put, pop it in your vagina. Um, but if it's continuous, you use one every night. Some people are using one every other night. Please don't do that. Please go back to one every night. And then again, some people are reducing the dose for the sequential. But if you are going to use, ideally talk to your doctor about it first. Um, but basically, you must use the the the, the oral uh, the capsule in exact the same dose and the same regime that we know is safe orally. Can you use it with the e string? You can. Yes. Yes. And <laughs> I know I was thinking the other day, I was thinking, God, if I have to swap because it is making me moody, it's making me very, very snappy. Oh. And I was thinking, maybe I should try that when I was thinking, my God, with the E string and two of these up there, there's no room for anything else. Um, <laughs> but there you go. I digress. The um the other point I guess is is you know, with the with the with tropical estrogen, you know, with the applicator where people were sort of putting it up quite high, and these French studies have apparently shown that you only really need to put it sort of around the entrance. Is that the same with the eutrogestin or does the eutrogestin need to go up higher? Just pop it just just to it doesn't have to go. You don't have to really struggle to put it in. I mean, you know, it, it, it's you know, you don't you don't want it just at the entrance. You want to put it, but just just you know, a thing a finger finger length in, um, so that it stays there, um, and and it gets absorbed pretty quickly. Um, you have to warn you have to warn patients that you sometimes get a little bit of whisk, a white discharge coming out the next morning, and that's just the capsule coming out so the contents dissolve quite quickly uh, and then you just sometimes get the sort of capsule coming out and and lots of people like it some people don't uh but but it's definitely a good option if if you're struggling it with 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 taking it all really so try it fiona let us know how you get on 
<laughs> I am the human guinea pig. Um, <laughs> the what was I going to say? Oh, other alternatives. Then, if you don't get, if you if you do find that you're bleeding, if you especially because with the increased doses of of estrogen, you may get bleeding, mightn't you? So, yeah. what are other alternatives then to to stop that bleeding apart from the eutrogestin? So, so firstly, one thing just to say is that it's if we, when we're starting people on HRT, it's it's quite common to get erratic bleeding or what we call unscheduled bleeding for the first three to six months of, of, of starting HRT. So don't panic too much. We you know we start people on HRT, we review at three months, and we can discuss bleeding and fiddle around with the the, the, the doses and things if necessary then. But don't panic, particularly in the first three months. Um, but yes, yeah, so if someone is getting ongoing bleeding and it's it's not settling, and we tried upping the utrogestan or they they hate it and they don't want it anymore one really good option is the morena coil um that most doctors love because it ticks three boxes so the morena is a really good uh way of protecting the line of the womb and you don't have to you don't have to put two morenas in if you're going above the estrogen dose um it's very effective and it's a treatment for, for what we call endometrial hyperplasia so um, thickened lining of the womb so sometimes if if we're worried some patients if they're having ongoing bleeding they're actually going to have to have some gynecological investigations just to check there's nothing serious going on um, but if there's nothing serious going on or it's just a mild thickening they'll often then suggest putting a morena in because it will treat any thickening and it's very reliable at stopping that thickening coming back and it's your contraception if you still need contraception and if you've been having heavy bleeding, hopefully it would would settle that bleeding down. So so Moraine is a really good option, but it's not a quick fix. Uh, you've got to find somebody who's going to fit it, <laughs> which you know all about, Fiona. Um, but it is if you can get access to Moraine, it's a really good option. It's only licensed for uh, the endometrial protection part of HRT for four years, but we've got good guidance from the Faculty of Sexual and Reproductive Health that it's fine for five years, but you must have it changed at five years. Um, that's really important. So, because normally, if you have a marina put in age forty-five or over, that will do you for contraception. So, you might be told that's fine; you don't need another marina. We'll take it out when you're fifty-five. But if you then just go on HRT, you must remember that that marina has got to be changed every five years. Right. Um, now, back to the estrogen. Um, if you are on a higher dose of estrogen than is is usually required. Um, some people will feel, say they feel absolutely fine. Is that fine then to continue that way because obviously they're not having any particular symptoms or is there sort of a, are they in a false sense of security perhaps? Yeah, so so estrogen, it's a feel-good hormone. It makes us feel wonderful. Yeah, you're going to feel great, you know, on, on having said that. Some people feel awful on too high doses because they start getting sort of palpitations and anxiety and things like that. But some people feel wonderful on, on a higher dose of estrogen. So that's not a guide. Unfortunately, the fact that you're not bleeding doesn't mean that the, the line of the womb is building up. So, so yes, sometimes people get abnormal bleeding and that also that sign that you might have to get that checked up. But some people, their womb, their lining is just happily growing and growing and you don't realise. So the fact that you're not bleeding isn't really, um, re really uh, a, a sort of uh, a reassurance. I mean, it's more likely, you're more likely to bleed, but it, we can't say no bleeding means no problem. Okay. And the other side, you mentioned that some people do have symptoms. That can, what, what if the symptoms of having too much estrogen, are they similar to the ones that have happened? Oh, my dog, honestly. Are they, my neighbours have dared to move out of their apartment. I'm sorry, everybody. Um, <laughs> the, the symptoms of how dare they leave their, their, their apartment. The having too much or having too little is what are the symptoms like yeah. because we well, people, they're like saying that they're on this roller coaster when they're on quite high doses so so high doses can give you similar symptoms to low doses but the main ones would be anxiety palpitations a feeling of unease a bit hyper um they're, they're the main ones but uh so some people some people I'd say feel great on it but 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 really if, if you are on high if you have a look at that chart and you are on higher doses and you're not on a higher dose of estrogen uh, of progesterone and there are other options we talked about utrogestran and, and Mirena, but there are other options if we what people want to know about them later um but if you're on a higher dose and nobody's up to your progesterone um um or if you start if you're having irregular bleeding you do need to talk to your doctor Okay, question here from Louise. She's asking, what do you need to watch out for if you've had an ablation? 
Okay, so, so people have ablations if they have awful periods and the gynecologist will zaps the lining of the womb. Um, and, and the idea is that either you have much lighter periods or no periods. Uh, but some people, it can grow back. So some people have no periods for five, 10 years and then they do start getting light periods. Um, if you want a moraine, if you have an ablation and you want a moraine, they off, that that's not certainly the GP wouldn't fit it because you can have adhesions. It can be quite difficult to get the, the moraine in. So that would have to be a specialist gynecologist putting that in. And they, they're not that keen on putting moraines in. But but lots of people don't need a moraine because they're not not having any bleeding. Um, so so as the, with everything, if you start to get post ablation, when you know, no bleeding and then erra erratic odd bleeding again you'd want to talk to, to your doctor about that um but often if you've had an ablation even if you're quite young you can go straight on the continuous combined hrt you don't have to do the sequential hrt to start with but i guess i guess in terms of if you were on higher doses of estrogen would there be something then that you would be would you be looking for specific specific symptoms or would you just uh, be just the same just the same as um and any, as anyone else but you know you, the, the, the the lining can grow <laughs> Sorry. Uh, Papa, can you actually put her in the bathroom for a minute? Because, it, well, at least we might be able to hear her as much. Um, sorry. Uh, so, so, yes. So, so yeah, it, it can still still build up. So you'd still be you'd still be wanting to have an increased uh, endometrial protection. You, you, okay. That wouldn't change the, the guidelines. Okay. And people, if they are on higher doses and they wish to remain on them, should they have, you know, more regular... Um, uh, ultrasounds or something like that to to monitor their endometrium just to make sure they are staying safe. Well, that's sort of sort of closing the stable while the, when the horse is built is a thing. I think you know we need to be treating these these people properly. I mean, if someone's been on a high dose. Um, because this is only a recent thing that's come to light that this is what some some clinics are doing. Um, so I think if someone uh, is only just a little bit above, feels well, um, and hasn't had any abnormal bleeding, and they're happy just to increase their progesterone, you know, that's fine. But if someone's been on a really high dose for a long time and had any erratic bleeding, or, or I think probably if they've been, been, been it for a long time, it might be worth considering a, a scan just to check what's going on before they have more treatment. But I well, certainly the NHS can't offer sort of regular regular scans um all the time it, it, it just just isn't feasible i mean there are a few people who are incredibly progesterone intolerant and um their specialist says okay you can have a really low dose of uh, progesterone or not have the, the monthly progesterone but those people really would, do need to have six monthly scans and even within that six month they might develop problems and they might then have to go on and have surgery so it's it's not ideal um sometimes in that situation it's better just to have a hysterectomy so you can't then you can just have estrogen and you don't have to worry about the progesterone side of things but it's very individual um but but if, if you're just being managed and, and you know without regular scans you really need to be having a, a, a suitable amount of, of endometrial protection all right now we've got a couple of questions here so we've got over here on the stream yard, we've got, does progesterone only pill give any wound protection? I'm currently taking two eutrogestin continuous along with the pop. I'm, I'm guessing that's the issue. And concern it might be too much. Yeah. Okay, so the pop is the desigestrol, which is the progesterone only pill. Oh. Um, yeah. So, so oh, not this week. <laughs> so, so um, desigestrol, the the Cerizet, Sorel, is the various names. So that's that's a really good form of contraception for sort of the slightly older women. Um, so a lot of women on the mini pill in the, in their forties, and it's not enough. It's not licensed for endometrial protection. It's not thought to be enough for endometrial protection. So if you're on combined HRT and you need contraception. The desigestrol is one one of the options of just taking one, so you have to take that as well, and that's a very common uh, a common regime. Very very rarely, and this is not something that I would. This is a specialist uh, clinic thing, but very rarely, um, if someone can't take anything else, we're giving people two desigestrol as as their contraception and endometrial protection. But there's we haven't got lots of studies on that, and I certainly wouldn't recommend people doing that without specialist discussion and that, that would be a uh, you know a last resort if at the moment I mean it may you know there may be more studies and then we may have to have it might be part of the guidelines in the future but at the moment we can't re recommend that for everybody. Okie dokie and questions over here that have just scrolled away one second um, could I ask a question please can you use uh, can you use estrogel and eutrogestin if you've, if you've got high blood pressure? 
so you can i mean obviously we'd want to talk to you about how to lifestyle stuff to reduce the blood pressure and possibly medication but you can so the great thing about estrogen through the skin is that it doesn't raise your blood pressure and equally the same about you just and it can even sometimes reduce your blood pressure a bit so yes it's a good option um and, and i often find if if people are struggling with being overweight or in high blood pressure and stress you know if you get them feeling better on their HRT, so they're more motivated, and not aching so much, and sleeping better, and more confident. You, if you get get them feeling better, they're more likely to do the lifestyle stuff that brings their blood pressure down and and, and reduces their weight. Yeah. Uh, other question here: If you had an ablation a number of years ago, more than a decade ago, um, should she should the person have gone on HRT? But I mean, that was only if you would have symptoms of menopause, I would assume. Yeah, sure. It doesn't. You know, ablation is not going to change your hormone hormonal uh, status. Yeah. Um, and what happens if you're on a 100 patch but don't absorb enough from the patch and have to add a pump of gel each day? Does it really make a difference that they aren't actually that they that they aren't actually absorbing what like others? I'm not exactly sure what that means. But does, does one aid the absorption of the other? Does it make any difference? No, so we try, yeah, we try and stick with one method because uh, it, it, otherwise it gets complicated. And if you're not absorbing, there's not much point going up and up and on that particular dose. So, and, you know, that is taking you just over the recommended, um, you know, a guideline. So if, if you're not absorbing one patch, we try a different patch or try a, a, a different gel and then gradually go up with the dose of that. that yeah. That's the way of doing it. All right. Belle, um, I can't get along with HRT in any thought form. Uh, what can she do that doesn't involve HRT while her levels are up and down between, whoa, 90 and 780? That is a huge, whoa. Well, that's because <laughs> ovulation, it goes up to 1,300 and something. So so that's, that our natural cycle is really quite a, quite a, a variation in, um, in, in estradiol. Um, so, I mean, Yes, some people don't want to take HRT. Some people it doesn't suit them. Often, I find if you if they're desperate to try something, you keep on fiddling around and eventually do find something that suits them. But not always. And some people get fed up and want, just want to stop. So um, we do. Obviously, lifestyle is very important. There's ways of there's lots of triggers for making your things like your hot flushes and night sweats, sweats worse. So there's lots of way sort of lifestyle stuff you can do to reduce triggers. Improving your lifestyle helps as well, generally. Um, and then we do have non-hormonal medication we can use, particularly for the women who can't have HRT because of past history of a breast cancer or another hormonal lead dependent cancer. We do have other options we can try. Um, and it's a question of just going through, finding out what the worst symptom is for the patient and sort of going through and seeing how we can improve things. Um, but yeah, it, the, the, the fluctuations in perimenopause are, can be, be pretty grim for some people, but they, they will go eventually. But we can't, you know, the average age of the last period of menopause is about 51, but, you know, 45 to 55 is still within the normal range. Yeah. The, um, Lu Louise is asking about cervical cancer and high estrogen levels. Is that also a risk? No, it isn't. So cervical cancer is not hormonally driven at all. Um, um, and also vulval cancer and vaginal cancer aren't. Um, and a lot of these patients will maybe have radiotherapy and have their, their ovaries damaged and, and possibly potentially have early men menopause. So it's very important to get the message out there that all these patients can have HRT if they need it, if they want it. Okie dokie. Oh, Jacqueline's just saying she's 56 and she still has her periods and um and is and is perimenopausal. So there you go at 56. Um I can't remember where I was going to go after that. I know that there was something important, obvious. There's a lot of important things out of this thing, aren't there? Um the idea that we can just randomly change our estrogen levels or our HRT levels at home whenever we feel like it. Um, do, these, do these recommended doses and the consensus statements that have come out um, in the last week or so saying, you know, stick within these guidelines, these parameters, um, do they sort of put a, a, a nail into the coffin on that one? Should people stop sort of going, today I'm going to have three pumps and tomorrow I'm going to have six? 
you're just you're giving yourselves hormonal fluctuations uh, you know so it really really doesn't make sense so um i we, you know we, we suggest that yeah you you start at a lowish dose you you every two three months if you need to you can go up a bit um up to the maximum dose but some people it takes three months to notice a difference with a change in dose. Other people, they notice it, you know, very quickly. So, so we don't recommend sort of chopping and changing. I think it's fine if you're getting side effects and you want to reduce a bit. So if we start somebody on a standard dose, for instance, a 50 microgram patch, and she's getting awful breast tenderness and headaches and nausea and bloating, um, absolutely fine. So you say cut the patch in half and, and have, you know, a lower dose for two months and then, then go up again. But what we worry about is people going up you know, because people just might gradually go up, up and up and up. And you refer to the joint statement. So there's a joint safety, um, safety alert, which people can read on the British Menopause Society website, responding to this news about some clinics prescribing big doses of, of estrogen. So if anyone's interested, it's it's a joint, it's the British Menopause Society, the Royal Colleges of Obs and Gynae, and the Royal College of GPs, and the Society of Endocrinologists, and the, the, the Nurses Society. So it, it just says there's an awful lot of experts there who are all, all saying the same thing that, for, you know, we need to try and stick with the recommended doses, but with, you know, with the recommendation that some people might to go higher, but they need advice and guidance and informed consent. Um, um, but one thing, and what I really want to say is, if someone thinks, oh my gosh, I'm on two lots of 100 patches and three squirts of gel, whatever, don't just stop your HRT. You will feel absolutely terrible. Um, so you need to talk to somebody about you know, your individual circumstances and you know why you're on that dose and how you're feeling um, and your history and your age and everything else. And, and the doctor can advise you how to slowly reduce it and consider whether you need any investigations or whether you need an increased progesterone or whatever. But we know that HRT's got, HRT has got so many benefits. And I think the worry is that this is going to end up being another scare. And like we've had scares before. Yeah. And and women, really, because uh, this is not really about dosage. It's not about saying, it's not saying HRT is bad for you. It's not saying HRT is going to give you anything shocking or whatever. We, you know, what we, we know that there are safe levels. And this is all about, it's, yeah. it's just literally about safe levels of prescribing. So if somebody is, that was going to be my question to you. But you know, before I get to I get to, to that one as well, is, is if people are being told then that, you know, you need more because you haven't responded, you need more because you haven't responded, um, should they perhaps seek a second opinion? Um, yeah, I think so, especially if they're not being given more, more, more endometrial protection. Um, I think, I think that if it's, if, if they've been seeing private clinics and there was there are lots and lots of private clinics now, um, I mean, obviously the issue would be they might not be able to afford to go back and get more advice from the private clinic. So, I, I think you know some people are going to end up going to their GP. Um, some GPs will will know what to do, and some GPs won't. Um, so um, that that can't, might might be tricky. But and obviously we know how busy, busy general practice is. So you know it's it's not an emergency. So hopefully you've got to speak to your GP first thing on Tuesday morning. The Tuesday the morning after a four day weekend. Please don't do that. <laughs> um, it, it, it's not an urgent thing at all. But. If you can't get, um, you know, good advice from from your your prescriber, if, if it's a private clinic, or if you can't get in to your NHS menopause clinic to get more information, um, then you know, go by your GP, and the GP can always write to the menopause, the NHS menopause clinic, or whatever, to try and get a bit more advice. But please just don't stop it, because when we had the scares, we had the awful study 20, 20 years ago. Uh, that was wrong, but it said that there were lots of risks with HRT. You know, women threw their HRT away, doctors stopped prescribing it, and it took, you know, the, our HRT prescribing dropped for years and years and years. So it's, as you say, this isn't a scale like that. It's just literally saying we've got to get people on the, a safe dose for them. Yeah. Um, if they do decide that they're going to start tapering off or, or whatever, generally, is, is there a sort of a tapering rule? I mean, you know, with antidepressants and things like that, you'd normally have a sort of a schedule that you'd follow down. Is there a, or is it sort of like, you know, cut it in half, cut it in quarters? How, do, how would people generally sort of yeah. approach um, that? There's no definitive guide. Um, but, you know, I yes, if, if you've got patches, you can cut them. I think the pharmacists get a bit anxious, but it's fine to cut. The modern patches are fine. So if it's a patch, you just slowly, you know, cut a bit off or, yeah, as you say, cut it into quarters and have, have, have a quarter less every every month or so, something like that. Um, I tend to say, you know, I get, go up in, so this is equivalent. So I go, go up in 25 microgram patch equivalents or one, one, uh, one 
pump of estrogel, um, just just or 0.5 milligrams of sandrina. So I don't, I don't jump any more than that. I think some clinics are sort of starting people on a 100 microgram patch and then go up to 150 and then 200 and sort of jumping up really quite quickly. But but lots of people, you know, that's what that's what we're trying to guide against. Yeah. So if you were coming down, you were on patches, you could maybe, you know, get a if you were on, say, 100, you could get a, a 75 and then a 50 or something and then just sort of slowly bring yourself down over over a you know like a month on each or something how long does it take yeah, you yeah, something, something like that and if you've got 100 patches you can cut them um because you know if, if, if it's hassle trying to get hold of the gp and getting getting the, a new prescription um you can to start with you can just cut so if, if you're well, so if you're on 200 patches yeah you could <laughs> cut two 200s you could you know cut them in quarters and just just gradually reduce down but i see yeah reduce Reduced by twenty five microgram or equivalent every month, something like that. But it, it's 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 a bit of guesswork, really. But yeah, stopping it suddenly, you're just going to feel potentially feel ghastly, and yeah. you know you're you're not going to get all, all the benefits um, that we know that HRT gives people. Yeah, exactly. Angela's saying she fluctuates between three to four pumps, but can use can use a higher. Uh, but can can the higher dose cause face tingling and tinnitus? Um, as she's been experiencing that since since she upped the dose to four last June, but the MRI shows there's nothing wrong. That's an interesting one, actually. It is. It is. So it, often tinnitus is caused by lack of estrogen, and it's a, it's one of the one of the many menopausal symptoms. So that's an interesting one. But I mean, unless everybody's different, but it's not a classic sign of too much estrogen. I mean, she could do some trials. She could have two months on three, and then two months back on four. And you know, if it came back and then it went again when she went down again, well, maybe it's some something interesting with her her physiology. But no, it's not a classic. It's this classic symptom of not too not not enough rather than too much. Okie dokie. Fascinations Headwear is asking, who are you? Because <laughs> she can't read this because it's too far away from the screen. This is the very lovely Dr. Juliet Balfour. Um, now, where was I? I think I think we've pretty much really covered most of these things, haven't we? Is there anything else that we need to think about? Not panicking. Um, yep. Speaking to your doctor if you can find it. It's probably easier to find. Um, easy, probably easier to find a doctor these days than it is to find your HRT. Um, <laughs> you know, speaking, um, to yeah, not panic. Find your doctor if you do think you're on something that's too high and you're worried about it. To talk to your doctor then about sort of slowly weaning down. Um, I do, is is there anything else we need to to think about? So if we just just talk a quick quick bit more about bleeding, I guess. So so basically, if someone's listening to this and they're not on HRT and um and their last period was at least a year ago and they start bleeding, that counts as postmenopausal bleeding, and you need to talk to your G. That is fairly urgent. You talk to your GP. Um, they'll they'll have a look and get take a good history, and you'll be needed to refer urgently to the gynecologist. So that that's standard postmenopausal bleeding. And then if you start HRT, as I've already said, it's it's not unusual to get an erratic bleeding for the first three to six months. Even in somebody who hasn't had a period for years, naturally, they can still um, have a bit of erratic bleeding. And if it's setting down, that's great. But if it's not, again, you need to talk to your doctor. They can adjust your HRT. And again, then you might need some further investigations. But because women on it, lots of women on HRT do have erratic bleeding, the, the gynecologist is getting inundated because so many people are big on HRT and then they're, they're, they're getting bleeding. So the gynecologists are really inundated, um, which, which is tricky. Um, and hopefully, and at the moment, quite a lot of protocols say that if someone gets erratic bleeding on HRT, they have to stop their HRT for six weeks to see if um, the, the bleeding goes away. And obviously lots of women don't want to stop their HRT for six weeks. And yes, fine, if the bleeding stops, but then they go back on the HRT and the bleeding comes back, you still haven't really excluded other issues like polyps and thickened line of the womb. And there's lots of other causes that, that things that can cause bleeding. So you've got, you know, you've got ovarian pathology can cause bleeding, you've got polyps, you've got the thickening, you've got fibroids, and you've got vulval lesions and cervical lesions and you've got um and vaginal lesions um so um it's important if that bleeding is ongoing that you do talk to your doctor and and hospitals are looking at their protocols and may, hopefully at some point they might stop the uh, uh stop the the rule to uh stop your hrt for six weeks because they say it's it, it's not a popular thing and it doesn't really help anybody no i can't imagine many people would agree to doing that i've got to admit i'd be looking at them going are you clinically insane <laughs> <I'm sorry. laughs> no that's not happening um 
Excellent. All right. Anything else? I was looking at my little um, list of questions here. I think I've ticked off everything. Uh, I've let me see if I've got, I don't know that I've got any, uh, da, 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 I've got, you wouldn't believe how many bits of paper I've got on my desk. So many. Um, let me just double check. I don't think I've got the right bit of paper for uh, things that I wrote down. Um, so. I have a couple of general questions while you're looking. Somebody here saying testosterone levels to improve their energy level, testosterone gel to improve their energy levels. Should they ask? At what stage would you be talking to to somebody about? I mean, well, basically, they're, they're going to say it's, it is recommended for people with um, low libido, not necessarily for energy levels. Um, so what do we think about testosterone and energy levels? Yes. Yeah. So no evidence so far. So there've been lots of, the, we have had lots of studies on testosterone, but they've all been quite small. Um, and they've shown clearly that in some women, testosterone will help low libido, but not in everybody because there's so many different causes and factors that go into low, low libido, but it does help some, but some people, but it, the, the studies so far haven't shown any improvement in energy levels or brain fog or concentration or mood or stamina, but there's no doubt some some women I see in clinic, it it helps. You know, anecdotally, some women seem to feel so much better on testosterone. So the really good news is there's more trials coming, um, which is fantastic. So there's a, 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 a professor of endocrinology in, in Australia who's going to be doing trials um, on testosterone. And then I think there's going to be some UK trials as well. Um, so we need a definitive answer. But at the moment, um, you're... Just, just a bit of energy, energy issues is not a, not an indication for testosterone. Most important thing is you're on a, the right amount, decent amount of estrogen that's giving you, um, uh, giving you symptom relief for almost everything. So if someone's still got, is on an, I see lots of people wanting testosterone and on a very low dose of estrogen. We've been talking about <coughs> really high doses, but in fact, I see, <coughs> excuse me, lots of people on far too low doses and they still got loads of symptoms. So. Um, you need to get somebody on the right dose of estrogen for them and you need to make, they need to be on estrogen through the skin because um, estrogen tablets can reduce libido. So you have to go onto transdermal estrogen. It has to be the right dose for them. You have to make sure all their, their vulval and vaginal symptoms are settled because nobody's going to thank you if you improve someone's libido and then sex is so painful they never want to have it again. So that's a really important thing. Um, and you, you also, we have to check your testosterone levels before you start testosterone because some women actually run at quite a high level and you don't want to be giving them extra testosterone because then they might start to start having uh, more side effects so so there's there's lots we don't know about testosterone there's lots we don't know about how to measure testosterone in women it's it's a whole subject in itself but if you've still got low energy you look at your testosterone look at your estrogen and look at other things are you anemic is your thyroid a problem are you over are you over unfit you know all sorts of things we, we look at before we run for the testosterone. Yeah, actually, I found a woman. I'm going to, I'm going to be having a very interesting chat shortly about anemia and menopause, um, and not just from bleeding causes and things like that. Some really interesting causes that people probably don't really think about all that much, even um, you know, cytokines and immune responses and all of these sorts of weird things. So COVID and and um, and anemia mm -hmm. and all sorts of weird and wacky things. Actually, that's going to. I'm looking forward to that. That'll be fun. Um, brilliant. Well. Yes. Did you did you find anything else that you think that we should tick off, or you think we've done? Um, I didn't find my uh, piece of paper, and I think probably um, I won't find it in time. Da, 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 so I think. Um, oh, hang on, that's one bit of paper. Um, da, 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 da. Just for those of you who are on Instagram here, the reason why we're doing this over here is because it goes on to Facebook and YouTube and Twitter simultaneously. But unfortunately, it doesn't go simultaneously onto Instagram. So if you've come in late, that's why you're looking at the screen of my laptop, unfortunately. So I, I mean, I think what I, I'd, I'd just like to say is I think it's incredibly difficult for women at the moment to know who to believe, you know, what to think you get you know, one newspaper article saying something, another newspaper article saying something else. So, um, so I think I would, I would, um, you know, I, I mentioned, we mentioned women's health concern before. So I think, you know, you, you need, to, that's a really good website. Um, the, and for the doctors, the British Menopause Society is a really good uh, website. Really, there's loads of tools for clinicians there. So you can learn about how to prescribe testosterone, learn about the correct doses of, of progestogen for the for depending on uh, what estrogen you're on there's all sorts of really good information there and then 
other good things for patients is rock my menopause which is a really good um and that's the patient arm of the primary care women's health forum which is really good for doctors and then we've got the menopause matters website that's good for doctors and patients so um those those are some websites that that the evidence-based and they're run by menopause specialists who, who follow all the guidelines and some of them, some of them write the guidelines so uh, the vms does some really for gps the vms does some really good consensus statements as well um saying what the current evidence is but it's certainly uh, as we just don't have enough evidence of a lot of this stuff and hopefully there's going to be more research into women's health and 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 we get more definitive evidence about what to do with because there are lots of gray areas in in menopause management and it's kind of an art as well as the science um and so i'm sure patients find it quite difficult and i think doctors find it quite difficult as well and particularly gps who have very you know short consultations and it's very very difficult to start someone on hrt in a 10 minute deep consultation yeah, so absolutely. um just, I'm just acknowledging that it's it's quite difficult for everybody at the moment. Um, yeah, and I think Joanna summed it up here. She's on a high dose of 175, and she says she's feeling terrified. And um, but there's no reason to panic. Yeah, it's this is not an urgent issue, and it's you know discuss it with your 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 the person who prescribed it if you can, and otherwise you know talk to your GP is you know in a routine routine um telephone appointment and, and and they they can go through it um but yes there are you know there are going to be women who are worried and and but you know most women are going to be absolutely fine um but it and and th there's a lot of time uh you know where as the, with the lining room thickens sort of slowly um and then sometimes it just thickens but it doesn't produce worrying cells you know sometimes it produces slightly worrying cells but but there's a lot of time before it would actually and they don't all develop into cancer and there can be a lot of time before it actually develops into a cancer so please i don't want anyone to panic but it, it's good that it's this come up it's really good that we've got a consensus sort of really statement from all these experts about what the best thing is to do um yeah. and you might you know everybody's individual so you might need a bit more but it does need discussion and thought uh, we just don't want people just going up and up and up and up, hoping that their symptoms are going to improve. So, uh, yeah, I, I understand it, it, it's very tricky for women. She says that. She says that. What do I do? It's really difficult at the moment. But yeah, I think that's the sad thing about all of this in the end. It just leaves everybody more confused. And that's it something. does. It does. But, I mean, the, the bottom line is that we know, and NICE have said, that for most women under the age of 60, the benefits of HRT outweigh the risks. And I think that's a really important thing to end on. And and just acknowledge that women who can't take HRT, we know that it's really hard for you. Everyone go about HRT and how wonderful it is. You know, we need to improve our care of patients who've had breast cancer and other other cancers who who often their often their um, you know, the, the treatment induces an early menopause, or they or they then go through a menopause and can't have HRT. And you know, there are other options for them. And if you if you're not if you're not getting joy from your GP with with any sort of HRT related thing. There are NHS menopause clinics. There's not enough of them, um, but you can look on the British Menopause Society website and find out where they are. And you can ask your GP to refer you to the nearest NHS menopause clinic. The waiting lists are long at the moment, um, but you can, the letter can just, uh, the, the doctor can, your GP can just write uh, what we call advice and guidance. So if they sort of think they know what to do, but they're not sure, or they just need a bit of guidance about how to reduce a dose, they can write to the menopause clinic. And instead of them seeing the patient, they can just say, well, try this, do this, suggest this. Um, and that, you know, would take a lot less time than waiting months to be seen face to face. So yeah, there are options. options. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that, that is a really good idea. Brilliant. All right, we shall leave it there. So everybody, this is a very lovely Dr. Juliet Balfour, who I haven't spoken to for nearly as often as I should have recently. <laughs> um, and where can we find you, darling? Uh, so you can find me on Instagram at Menopause Health. Um, you can't see me privately because I'm concentrating on my NHS work and I'm just looking after my follow-up patients. Um, but uh, yeah, you, you can uh, see me on it. Um, um, if, if you're in Somerset and you've got problems, you can come and see me at the Somerset NHS Menopause Service. But you have to be referred by your GP and you have to be a bit complex because I can't just see people who'd like a nice 40 minute chat with me. Because <laughs> uh, we've got to save it for the really complex, tricky patients. So sorry about that. Well, I guess I'll just have to see you after hours then. There you go. 
Um, excellent. Look, thank you very much, darling. I will end that now and I will end this here on Instagram. If people want to see this afterwards, this will save to YouTube and there you can watch it in a there you can watch it looking really nice, not on on a on a laptop screen. Um, if you want to see it back, and um that would be a very good thing. Subscribe to the YouTube so you know when these things are coming up. That would be a useful thing. Um, I will speak to you soon. Thank you very, very much and take care, everybody. Bye. Nice to see you, Fiona. Bye. Yeah, bye.